Welcome to Surgeon's Log 2020, Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond, a webinar presented by the North American Skull Base Society in association with Global Brain Surgery Initiative. I'm your host, Dr. Walter Jean of George Washington University. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. For now, put on your learning hats and enjoy this episode of Surgeon's Log 2020. Case Archives of the Skull Base and Beyond. Special guest today, the presenting surgeon is Calvin Mack, uh, who is a clinical assistant professor of neurosurgery at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, obviously, a very special place for me. And uh, taking a cue from uh, Dr. Tatajiva last week, I'm going to actually introduce the place. Uh, this is uh, where I'm from, uh, home for me. Uh, you can see the skyline from uh, Kowloon to the island, which is uh, where home is. And uh, just to point out to Calvin that this is my school, a place that's near and dear to my heart. The discussant, uh, again, needs no introduction. Uh, professor Jacques Marcos is uh, co-chairman and professor of neurosurgery at University of Miami, director of skull base and vascular neurosurgery uh, there. Uh, um, related to the North American Skull Base Society. Of course, he's a former uh, president of the society and uh, too many awards to name. Uh, the most recent award, of course, is the Oscar for playing um, uh, Freddie Mercury in, uh, in uh, 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 Bohemian Rhapsody. How, how's that Oscar sitting on the mantle, Jacques? Uh, oh, terrific. Is it all clean? It's, oh, oh, very, very it's nice. just too shiny to be in front of me. Very, very nice. Uh, on the hot seat today, Vizish Sharavasan, who is a fellow uh, of neurosurgery at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, and he will be leading us off uh, on uh, this episode that we are calling the Dragon Tiger Afraid. I came very close to calling this Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon Part Two, but you know I thought that was a little bit too cliche. Uh, almost as cliche as the Asian art uh, theme of the dragon and the tiger, uh, the uh, terrestrial and the celestial battling, and you will see that we we are talking about a theme of above and below. Uh, today. So without further ado, here is the mystery case that Visish has been trying to get clues from for all, all week. 65-year-old man walks into CU uh, with the chief complaint of visual deterioration for three months. It is only applicable really on the left eye, uh, and she, he describes this as difficulty seeing clearly. Uh, the past medical history is non-contributory and unremarkable. He's able to walk in the clinic. Uh, the visual acuity is very poor on the left uh, and normal on the right. Um, there is a left temporal field cut uh, by examination and a gun pupil. Um, it's a little bit difficult to know whether the field cut is reliable given that there's a gun pupil and uh, a problem with vision. Ocular motility is normal and the rest of the exam is intact. Um, he had um, um, closer uh, uh, visual testing as well. There's optic disc pallor uh, and optic, uh, the optic nerve is thinned on tomography and there's also a temporal field cut confirmed on um, formal testing. So obviously, first question, what would you like uh, more from here? Oh, you're, you're muted. Okay. Hi. Um, so the um, I'd like uh, the rest of the neurological exam and history, uh, looking for, um, uh, you know, any other neurological uh, findings. There, there is no other thing to 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 talk about. There is no uh, previous episodes of eye problems. There is no uh, alcohol uh, consumption that's out of ordinary. Uh, there is no exposure to heavy metals and toxic toxic uh, chemicals, etc. Um, no family history that to contribute. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, based on uh, the history and the physical examination findings. I'm localizing this uh, to the uh, lesion around the uh, optic pathway. Um, this seems to be uh, likely uh, around the optic chiasm, uh, perhaps uh, also closer to the uh, left optic nerve, uh, which seems to be worse. Um, uh, but uh, close enough uh, to also involve the right side with, uh, uh, if I recall, there, there was some 
right side of findings or none at all? The, the right side was really not not very remarkable. Okay, so then this seems to be mostly uh, associated with the with the left optic nerve. Then uh, I'd like to get um, uh, some imaging. Uh, I would start with an MRI brain with and without contrast, as well as uh, orbit of uh, protocol as well. So okay, so these are guided studies. Uh, we do not have a non-guided study for you. Um, your initial thoughts. Yeah, so this is uh, axial, sagittal, and coronal um, uh, imaging, um, so T1 with contrast. And um, so what I'm seeing is an enhancing mass um, that is um, uh, involving, it seems to be uh, arising from the uh, tuberculum cella, I think. Um, so this is um, uh, mostly uh, supracellar. Um, it's, uh, it has a, a dural base to it as well. Uh, extending uh, into the planum synodale and uh, uh, would be compressing on the optic nerve. I, I believe the optic uh, chiasm I see on this uh, lower uh, uh, lower sagittal section um, seems to be just behind. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's sort of grayish there, uh, just on the backside of this lesion. And um, it's also involving um, uh, some vasculature, uh, so it's involving uh, the uh, definitely the left A1. Uh, it's close in proximity to the right A1 there, um, and so uh, we don't quite see all the rest of the vascularity, but it's basically around the uh, intercommunicating artery and complex. And, and we'll talk about this a little bit further. What what other sequence would you want to pay particular attention to now? Uh, so I, I like the uh, T2, especially a T2 coronal, uh, helps me to find uh, the optic chiasm. Uh, so this also helps to uh, see the, the vessels. Um, we can clearly see the uh, bilateral carotid arteries. Um, you can see the, uh, the uh, left A1 uh, is stretched over the top of the tumor uh, going to the uh, right A1, it looks like there. Um, and so the tumor is just underneath it. Um, right, so that gives so, us a sense of the origin. All right, so let's put a name to this. What is your diagnosis? Uh, so I would, I would diagnose this as a tuberculum meningioma. Okay, tuberculum meningioma. What uh, other tests would you like at this point, or, or if any? Uh, I think a, uh, uh, both for potential surgical planning, I'm not uh, committing to a surgical treatment quite yet, uh, but, uh, uh, and to evaluate the, uh, the lesion and the vessels around it. I go with the CTA um, brain. Okay, I think that's, that's very reasonable. Um, I don't have an A part for you, uh, but I do have a CT uh, of the yeah. bony anatomy. Anything that jumps out at you here? Uh, yeah, so we're seeing the, um, the uh, septations within the sphenoid sinus here. Um, it, so the septation is uh, deviated slightly to the right. That's something we may want to keep in mind for a uh, potential endoscopic approach. I also see uh, it looks like a pneumatized uh, left um, anterclinoid process. Right, yeah, okay. Now, how, the, okay, and we'll talk about that, the, the significance of that maybe later. Uh, all right, so. All right, so for the younger uh, audience uh, members, uh, maybe in the junior residency and whatnot, what are your, what is your, what are your eyes drawn to uh, when you look at these pictures? What, what, what do you pay, pay, pay particular focus, uh, attention to in order to sort of start designing your goals and designing your approach? Uh, yeah, so um, I, uh, you know, I always, in terms of designing my approach, I uh, focus uh, first on the goals and then that draws me to certain anatomic um, considerations. Uh, so if the goal is, uh, you know, taking uh, this tumor out uh, uh, as extensively as possible with the goal of uh, decompressing the left optic nerve and, and maintaining as much vision as possible, um, then uh, I'm drawn to, uh, to some different things. So uh, drawn to the uh, assessment of the surrounding vasculature, because that's what we need to uh, make sure we don't cause any injury uh, either to the large vessels or to small perforators uh, that may be arising from um, especially the uh, ACOM region. Um, okay. So that I can see, th th that's probably most useful from the uh, T2 coronal. That's what bring, that brings me to. Um, and, and specifically, what are you talking about in terms of the relationship between the, t and the ACOM complex or the anterior circulation complex and the tuba? You, so, uh, so I like to look at the um, the uh, intercarotid space uh, from side to side. Uh, so the the wider that may be, uh, that uh, makes a uh, an endoscopic approach uh, potentially more feasible or more favorable uh, if you have more side to side uh, working space. Okay, so no kissing carotids here. Correct. Uh, 
Um, uh, and then um, in terms of how high uh, the displacement of the vessels are um, and uh, whether the tumor extends uh, laterally beyond the carotids, uh, this doesn't appear to be, it, it seems to be um, uh, tethered in uh, between the carotids. Um, so it, it's rather midline. Okay, so you're, you're paying attention to the, a, the, anterior, the, the, the vascular complex to see whether there's, there's tumor abutment, encirclement, entanglement, uh, stenotic even, uh, sure. and also paying attention to the width of the tumor. Now, you said that it doesn't ex extend beyond the carotids. Uh, is it the carotids that you're paying attention to, or is there something even more lateral to it? And how, how do you personally judge uh, what is feasible from below or not? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the uh, within the... Uh, Lower down, the, uh, the cavernous segment of the carotid uh, as well as the clinoidal segment are kind of what bound you um, from the uh, from the anterior approach. And then as you reach higher up, uh, the supraclinoid carotids uh, uh, will naturally uh, go lateral. And um, uh, so, so that's your, your upper corridor. But you're still, uh, if you're going uh, transphenoidally, um, uh, that, that would be a limitation. Um, I would also like to see uh, later on uh, the consideration will be at the sagittal image to try and see uh, if you were to go endoscopically, what would be your, your trajectory, not just going transphenoidally, but uh, uh, trans tubercular, um, because that's where this tumor is coming from. And, okay. um, and, and what about that, what about that uh, pneumatized clinoid? Yeah, so uh, th this will be a consideration um, uh, if uh, when you start to reach that corner uh, of the tumor, if there's attachment there and you're um, trying to deal with that. Um, you can also see that the carotid artery is, is floating, uh, you know, right there in the middle of below that clinoid. Um, and so a pneumatized clinoid, if you, you know, drill the bone around it, uh, there'll be CSF on the other side. Um, so uh, that has to be a consideration when you consider repair, uh, either from below, you have to consider it, and, and then from above. Um, if you are drilling the clinoid, you get into that pneumatized clinoid, now you're communicating with the sphenoid space, so you have to reconstruct it either way. Just out of curiosity, if you're attacking this from above, would you drill the clinoid? Uh, even, even, if, even if the clinoid is not pneumatized? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that you need to, uh, to, to be able to tackle this. Um, I, I, I'd want to see uh, maybe be an axial T contrast, but I, I'm not convinced that you definitely need to drill the Okay, clinoid. so you wouldn't routinely drill the clinoid for tuberculum if you're coming above. That, okay, uh, all right, so let's uh, move on. Uh, oh, why am I not moving on? Uh, okay, the goal of treatment, which you already stated, let's restate it for the audience. Yeah, so my goal of treatment is um, uh, number one, uh, preservation and uh, improvement of his uh, visual status from the left eye. So. Uh, primarily decompression of the uh, left optic nerve from the tumor, and then uh, the rest of the optic apparatus as well. Uh, and then uh, number two is an oncologic goal, so um, uh, maximal safe resection of the tumor um, as much as possible. All right, so we've talked about most of this stuff. Uh, are, there, are, there, are there any things that you can uh, uh, think of other than surgery that would achieve any of those goals? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess uh, radio surgery can be mentioned. Um, I, I think that radio surgery, um, I'm not sure if I have numbers uh, uh, in terms of data to, to cite, uh, but uh, with the proximity of this to the optic nerve, um, to treat this with stereotactic radio surgery, the optic nerve can only handle about eight gray um, um, of, of radiation uh, if you're doing a single dose. And uh, I just don't think you're gonna be able to deliver enough uh, a dose to the tumor uh, while keeping the rest of the optic apparatus safe. So, but, uh, but you said that, something really smart before, and I'll reiterate for the audience, and that is that the goal has to come first. Once you set the goal and your goal is for decompression of the optic nerve, then radio surgery is really out because, yeah. I mean, the, the radio surgery is not going to decompress the optic nerve. So setting the goal really does tell you a lot about what comes downstream and goal should always come first. I completely agree with you. So, uh, okay, there's not a lot of alternatives here. Now comes the big question, right? This is the, the $50,000 question. Uh, up, uh, the next one is a million dollars. So what are the options here? What are the pros and cons of the options? Go. Uh, okay, so uh, the options is uh, broad categories uh, without their modifiers would be um, uh, 
either an endoscopic uh, endonasal approach versus a uh, transcranial approach. So within the endoscopic endonasal approach, uh, it would basically be a uh, endoscopic endonasal transphenoidal, uh, probably transtubercular approach um, uh, for resection. Um, and um, I have to look at some of that dura extends along the, the planum, some of that um, uh, disease dura or, or the dural attachment. Um, I don't, uh, so, some of that may have to be uh, resected either to both devascularize the tumor or to, to get the proper angle. Um, I'd be able to tell that for sure from the sagittal, um, but that's, uh, th those would be my modifiers on that. Um, and uh, uh, the second approach, main, main approach category would be a transcranial approach. Um, to do that, I think I would probably do this uh, as a, uh, you could do a terional uh, or an orbitoterional. I don't think the, taking the orbit uh, particularly gets you a whole lot here. So I'd probably do this as a, a, a standard uh, terional uh, transylvian approach. Uh, I would not take the uh, interclinoid process here. Um, and uh, in terms of side, uh, I would come from the left side. So that's the side that you want to focus on in terms of uh, decompressing the nerve. You'll be able to see, you know, you want to be able to identify that nerve early, preserve it, uh, and uh, debulk the tumor um, uh, while keeping it in, in your view. All right, so the strengths and weaknesses of those approaches will come next as you discuss this, which is a $1 million question. Which one of these are you going to choose and why? So, um, I think uh, I will ultimately, I, I'm gonna choose the endoscopic and nasal approach. Um, part of that is, uh, uh, this is a, a tumor that uh, is favorable for this because it's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's staying uh, relatively midline. It's not extending uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the carotids uh, going laterally. Now I have, to say, I have to say that it does go a little bit right on the lateral edge of the carotid on the left okay. side here. But, okay. but I'm, just, I'm just, just pointing that little bit out. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, e even if with that little bit, I, I, I don't think I would change my mind uh, because of that uh, small little bit. Uh, I'd be mindful of uh, uh, probably not reaching to that corner uh, as I, I track the tumor uh, um, uh, in the endonasal corridor. Um, so uh, the other pros I see for this, uh, you get uh, early devascularization uh, of the tumor because you're, you're approaching it from its uh, dural base. Um, you uh, don't have any brain retraction, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, you're also not manipulating the optic uh, chiasm um, uh, until you've already de decompressed the tumor. You're, you're encountering the tumor uh, very early uh, in your surgery. You're debulking it, uh, relaxing the, um, the tension on the nerve, and then your subsequent dissection becomes a lot safer. Now you can do that um, from an open approach as well, uh, but it, it's not quite the same. You, you do have to manipulate the nerve and, and, and uh, a little bit more than you do from the uh, endonasal corridor. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so I, I see those as the strengths, yeah. And, and, and I'll add to, it, I, I know you know this, I'll just add to it for the audience sake. That there's no con contraindications that are absolutely glaring, right? There's no wrap around of the ACOM. Yeah. There's no wrap around of either the, uh, of the, of the optic nerves. Uh, there's no wrap around of the, of the carotids. As you said, it doesn't go beyond the lateral side of the carotid, even just a little bit uh, on the left side. So there's, there seems to be a lack of contraindications or no kissing carotids that you already mentioned. All right, so your, your, your uh, transtuberculum tra endonasal approach. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, excellent job. Professor Mack, your turn. I will control your sides as you uh, give, give your thoughts on this. What, what did you sure. think? What did you go? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Well, um, so uh, for this case, it's um, um, uh, clearly it's a tuberculum setting and angioma. And uh, just one more piece of information is the profile, a hormonal profile was checked and was normal. It's uh, relevant if we especially want to go from below. Uh, of course, it's usually normal, but we do check it as a routine test. So, um, okay, so, well, um, um, as mentioned, so uh, there are big, two big groups of categories of approaches. Uh, the main goal, as um, very correctly pointed out, is for um, a maximal safe resection, also a decompression of the optic nerve. As you can see, that the, um, the optic is very compressed. So um, uh, the transcranial approaches, including from going from the side, uh, um, very classical terrional transylvian approach, it can also be tackled from subfrontal. Uh, from anterior and also from uh, from, from interhemispheric as well. 
Um, and of course, the other category would be extended endoscopic endonasal approach, the EEA approach. So um, for the advantages and disadvantages of each approach, I will um, um, then uh, present here. So for the transcranial approach, the advantages include um, it's a familiar um, anatomy under microscope um, to most uh, neurosurgeons. Um, um, it allows actually uh, a superior bimanual dissection with um, uh, two hand approaches uh, with as much dexterity as compared with um, um, endoscopic endonasal, um, again, for most neurosurgeons. Um, the CSF can be released um, from the cistern quite early on to allow a brain relaxation. Um, and it can have an advantage to control of any encased vessels, including the anterior communicating artery complex or the ICA or the perforators. And um, it also have a lower risk of CSF leak. Um, uh, apart from this case that um, there is a pneumatized um, anterior clinic process, but um, uh, comparatively speaking, um, uh, of course, compared to the endoscopic and nasal approach, it does have a lower risk of CSF leak, which um, is crucial uh, because CSFD can lead to um, quite a dis disastrous meningitis and CSFD infection. Disadvantages, um, there would be some scars, um, temporalis atrophy, and uh, brain, well, retraction or actually enough brain relaxation might um, uh, save a, a retractor, but uh, still there is some brain man uh, uh, manipulation. It's a typo here, it's brain, by the way. Um, and the optic nerve um, uh, will be manipulated somehow during the dissection. And um, uh, this is um, uh, of importance that it is difficult to visualize the inferior side of the optic canal and also difficult to visualize and get around to the vascular supply of, of the uh, optic chiasm. So especially if there is a tumor um, that is very invasive um, that wraps around the perforators there, it's difficult to visualize uh, with a microscopic view. So the advantages of EEA, uh, it is minimum invasive, uh, no external wound apart from, um, uh, depends on surgeons practices. Uh, sometimes we need um, abdominal fat graft or fascia lata, that would be an, another wound, but no wound over the face and head neck region. Um, it offers direct extra dural access to the dura base um, and it can be uh, devascularized and resected very early on, uh, giving a possibility and potential for a Simpson one resection. Uh, which otherwise would be difficult. Um, we can also upfront decompress both optic canals extra durally uh, before tackling the, the, the tumor or any manipulation. Um, uh, the analogy would be um, uh, doing an, um, a clinodectomy, opening up the um, uh, optic canal and then uh, do the surgery afterwards um, for large, for example, clinodal meningiomas that would um, um, uh, release the tension during a, a section uh, and that can potentially um, uh, save the, the um, function of the optic nerve. Um, it can also offer direct access and visualization to both uh, paraclinoid ICAs, um, the pituitary stalk, and the medial aspect of the optic canal. And the small perforators uh, supplying the optic chiasm and nerve can be visualized um, quite well. And uh, some advances, um, uh, I missed out one uh, point here, is the angled endoscopes and angled instruments. Um, um, I use quite a lot of uh, the angled endoscope and the malleable instruments um, and also using the um, chopsticks techniques as well uh, that is um, um, uh, promoted uh, by uh, Professor Sebastian Frolich. Uh, it's quite useful. And um, uh, with, um, we do have the uh, opportunity to use a 3D endoscope um, here in Hong Kong uh, in my center, um, which uh, offers a superior sense of depth and the dexterity. I would say it uh, can be comparable to uh, microscope and is actually it's even better uh, for the magnification, if you can imagine. Um, and uh, we also lately had a chance to play around with the ICG endoscope, which is um, offers um, another additional information that it can identify blood supplies and also to see where's the pituitary gland, where's the tumor with a different phase of enhancements by the ICT. Of course, its disadvantages include uh, CSF leak. This is the major um, enemy um, against um, uh, EEA approach. Uh, the CSF leak rate um, is um, statistically, it is uh, still um, uh, more significant than uh, doing a transcranial approach and it can obviously lead to CNS infection. A vascular injury, it can um, 
uh, happen, especially if the tumor is hard and if it's encasing the um, arteries. Uh, optic nerve injury, um, not very common, but uh, it can cause a devascularizing the, the optic nerve that can cause uh, ischemia. And uh, nasal morbidities, which would not happen for a transcranial approach, uh, anosmia and uh, sinusitis. So um, some contraindications, therefore, for EEA approach is if it's um, 360 degree encasement of vessels. Now take a look at the um, image uh, on, on the right hand side. Uh, you see that the, um, the both A1s and uh, probably the uh, A2s are uh, encased inside the tumor. Um, I would say this is an, um, I, I won't do an EA approach for this case. Um, it's uh, very dangerous. And um, some relative contraindications, um, like if it uh, extends laterally beyond the cavernous sinus. Now this is debatable. Uh, I've done cases um, uh, that uh, with a, it's a soft uh, tuberculum sediment angioma uh, operated from transcranial before recurred and involved lateral uh, to the carotid. Um, I did it from below and uh, leave the part that is lateral uh, to the carotid uh, for uh, uh, radio surgery afterwards because um, the goal of the surgery is to decompress the, the optic. Um, if it's a very uh, large tumor that it's uh, very tall, it extends superiorly above the third ventricle with hydrocephalus. Obviously, I don't. I think um, a more direct choice would be going from above um, to release uh, some CSF as well. If it's a calcified tumor, if it's hard, um, there would be relative contraindications to me as well. Um, and um, if it's uh, not pneumatized sphenoid. So back to our case, um, it seems. Um, uh, quite favorable for EA is a two centimeter plenum, uh, meningioma, medial to both carotids, no encasement of vessels, nerves, and it's well pneumatized. All right, this is this is your masterpiece here. <laughs> well, just uh, sharing uh, what we have done, um, not a masterpiece. Uh, well, this is uh, in essence going from the um, the uh, nostril from the uh, uh, right side, I believe, uh, using a micro debrider. Um, and then opening the um, this uh, sphenoid sinus. So we're now inside the sphenoid sinus. This is a malleable suction. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, the sphenoid sinus is very pneumatized. And uh, we're now opening up the, um, uh, the skull base. The uh, approach is actually trans uh, tuberculum and transplanum as well. Uh, this is, um, we, we move the skull base uh, bone with the drill. And um, uh, this is the, uh, the surgery is packed uh, over the anterior intercovenous sinus with some uh, minor venous woozing. Uh, the thing that was removed is the uh, medial OCR, the optic carotid uh, recess, which is the key uh, to the uh, transtuberculum approach. And we check the um, uh, uh, location with the um, uh, navigation as well. And well, was that the, was up. that the left op, is that the left optic nerve that's already been shown here that's kind of like yes. floating in in the sinus? Yes, exactly. That is the uh, very well uh, pneumatized um, uh, ACP that we see from the uh, CT scan. So again, CT scan is very important. So this is the H shaped um, dura opening, um, and uh, this is cauterization of the uh, anterior cavernous uh, intercavernous sinus, and this is removal of the tumor. Um, you see, the tumor is quite uh, soft. Um, uh, and um, we used the CUSA to uh, do the debulking as well. Now here is uh, after the removal of the tumor, um, you see that the dura is uh, basically is opened and it's devascularized and um, actually no coagulation uh, was used uh, inside. We can see the perforators very clearly. This is um, um, the uh, left side, the optic nerve, the right side uh, over the right end. You can see the pituitary stock there with the um, hypophysial arteries. Uh, supplying the uh, stalk and also the um, uh, inferior side of the um, of the optic chiasm as well, and you were able to take a glimpse of the pituitary gland as well. You can see that the indentation over the left optic uh, nerve uh, caused by the tumor. Now this is a 30 degree endoscope. Um, as I said, we use um, uh, quite often angled endoscope. This is the carotid uh, over the left side. As um, uh, Walter pointed out, that there is a little bit of extension. Um, over the uh, left carotid as well, and it's actually um, over the left uh, optic canal as well. And we open it up and check if there's any residual or any residual compression. 
So, so you drilled a little bit of the undersurface of the optic canal, right? So you opened the, a little bit of the video optic frame. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, actually, both sides as well. Both, both sides. sides. Okay. Now this is um, uh, the hemostasis uh, and the reconstruction bed. Um, we put in a surge cell, um, uh, try to kind of reconstruct the um, layer of the arachnoid. Um, nowadays, I sometimes I don't do it anymore. I just put a fat, uh, use an inlay uh, abdominal fat graft. And then and you, you move on to do the uh, nasal septal flap uh, at the end. Uh, yes. Since we're a little bit short on time, I'm gonna move you forward a little bit. Uh, I, I want to know why you did the nasal septal flap at the end. Well, um, because um, if it's uh, done in the beginning, um, I found it very bloody. And the surgical field would be filled with um, uh, blood, as you can imagine. And um, also, um, I want to tailor make the size of the, um, the flap. Uh, what matters most is the, is, the, um, is the tip of the flap, because it covers the skull base. And um, so what I do is um, um, I will measure um, how large the dura defect is, the skull base defect is, and then um, uh, do it, uh, and then use that size to, to measure how large I, I need to take the flap. Sometimes okay, so then I you design the flap down. at the end uh, after your opening. Yes, because sometimes I need to incorporate the uh, nasal floor as well. So obviously you have an excellent uh, outcome here, uh, no leak at the end and uh, you had a complete resection on uh, imaging studies. And uh, now you want to say, say a couple of words about the, the literature here, go ahead. Yeah, so um, of course there's an, uh, a long um, um, uh, discussion uh, still till now, like uh, whether it's going from below or from above. Uh, there's a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, showed comparing the EEA and transcranial groups and the vision improved um, improvement for EEA is a uh, 80-ish percent, while the transcranial group um, is 60 percent. Um, it's uh, better for EEA as, however, for the, the CSF leak uh, from this um, meta-analysis showed it's uh, um, quite significant for EEA. It's 20 percent uh, versus 5 percent for transcranial. So another, uh, it's um, uh, quite a, a recent um, a, a paper published uh, by the um, uh, International Consensus Statement on Endoscopic Skull-Based Surgery. I would recommend uh, for those uh, junior uh, residents uh, who are interested should go through this um, uh, uh, paper. And it uh, summarizes that uh, for the EEA, the CSF leak percent um, the overall is 14%, uh, uh, with um, the flap is uh, down to 10%. Without the flap is quite high, 20%. Um, of course, this is a, um, uh, uh, um, um, gathering of all of the series. Um, it uh, varies from standards to standards. Of course, those um, very experienced would have a lower leak rate. Uh, uh, however, across the board, the visual improvement is, seems uh, to be a more significant than the transcranial um, um, uh, approach. So there is a learning curve, of course. Um, uh, this is a study um, published by Schwartz, uh, his group uh, quite early back then in 2014, um, showed the earlier experience uh, with a quite significant CSF leak, 25%, one fourth, but um, afterwards with um, uh, um, experience, the CSF uh, leak is much lower. All right, so, and here's your series. Oh, yes, uh, just a, a quick sharing of what we've done. Um, uh, we've done 20-ish uh, cases uh, in um, three, four years time. We started to use 3D endoscope uh, starting from 2019 uh, with also cranial nerve monitoring in selected cases as well. Uh, we monitor third and sixth and um, uh, sometimes um, uh, fifth, uh, seventh, depends on cases, of course. Um, partial encasement of ICA, 50%, uh, no uh, complete encasement of carotid, uh, which means if it's more than 207 uh, uh, degrees, we won't do it. Um, uh, all have improved individual outcome. Complications, we have one case of CSF leak, uh, which is uh, 4%. Um, treated with a lumbar drain insertion, uh, uh, no, uh, no need to go in for another surgery for repair. Uh, one patient had CSF, CNS infection because it's a case of a penicillin allergy, uh, treated with antibiotics afterwards. Uh, one puts up a, a cranial nerve deficit. That was the case of cranial pharyngioma and mot no mortality. Uh, excellent. Uh, and, and that is uh, your presentation. Thank, thank you, Calvin. That was, that was wonderful. You got a did a very nice summary of the uh, ins and outs and ups and downs of uh, EEA versus uh, transcranial. 
uh, I had to point out a couple of things. One is that chopstick technique that you were talking about. Uh, funny that a whole bunch of Asian guys are talking about chopstick techniques invented by Frenchmen. Um, the <laughs> problem with the chopstick technique is that for the audience who don't know this, that the, the, the sucker and the endoscope are both in the left hand. Now, I, I'm right-handed. I don't use a chopstick. I don't know how to use a chopstick in my left hand, even though I'm a fluent chopstick user in real life uh, every day. So uh, that, that, that kind of freehand technique actually does uh, take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, it's not as intuitive as one thinks, uh, but, that's a, but that's an interesting. It's also very interesting that you did your flap at the end. I think that it segues into what I want to talk about very, very briefly. And that is um, doing the same uh, thing with uh, virtual reality rehearsal. And now I know that the Sish likes my VR stuff. And, and so here, here's a little bit of something, something. Um, about the opening and the size of the opening. If you, uh, if you practice the opening for a specific tumor and you design the opening uh, perfectly for that tumor, you can use that opened, uh, that file that you drilled as a template to bring into the operating room. And when you navigate using that template, then you know exactly how big you need to open to get this tumor out. You're never gonna make a bigger opening. I call this a Goldilocks opening uh, because it's not too big, not too small. And, and so the flap, can uh, reasonably be uh, used to, to cover this. Before I turn this podium to Professor uh, Marcos, I see a lot of Asian friends who are, uh, I, I guess, use chopstick technique and, and, and who, are, who are here with us. And since there are not too many uh, people uh, uh, in the audience today, I would like to take a poll. I want to uh, po pull some of our Asian friends here uh, who have joined us because it's early in the, in, in the in Friday morning. Uh, Professor Hong, um, Professor Yao, and uh, Professor Watanabe. Anybody want to chime in as to what they would do on this? Uh, who, who, who wants to do which way? Who, who wants to transcranial versus EEA? This is Kentaro Watanabe. What, what would you do, Kentaro? As, uh, I agree with Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark. So I think the transnasal approach is uh, feasible. But I think as a little bit, the tumor is extended as a little bit lateral. So the, another option uh, uh, is a transcranial approach, but uh, the tumor is extended to the inside of a uh, uh, cell. So I think it's a uh, transnasal approach is uh, uh, it's a feasible. It's better. And so can tell you you would you would go the EA. Yeah, Professor Yao, Singapore. What would you do in Singapore? Yeah, I think pretty, pretty similar to what they did in uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, so uh, we, we we do most of this uh, through the nose now. So I think almost uh, very similar experience to to Hong Kong. Yeah. Excellent. So you would do it from from below. All right. Not to belabor the point. I just I was just having fun seeing some of the, some of our friends uh, from around the world joining us. Um, so thank you, Calvin. Uh, I am now going to stop sharing my screen, and um, I, I want to present you um, our esteemed uh, guest speaker, uh, honored guest here, uh, Professor Jacques Marcos, uh, who is an uh, expert uh, cerebral vascular and um, skull base surgeon, um, former president of the North American Skull Base Society, who would enlighten us to the truth. Well, thank you for involving me in this. Uh, this is a topic very dear to, to my heart, and uh, uh, I thought... Uh, you guys, that was great. Uh, so, uh, transcranial versus endonasal, my disclosures are irrelevant. This is, uh, I'm beaming to you from lovely Miami. That's the building I'm sitting in right now in my office, the Lois Pope Life Center. Of course, uh, Walter and I go back a long way. We, we're from the same alma mater, University of Minnesota. Uh, we, there we were at some uh, meeting and then my uh, picture at the bottom is he was a really young man taking a course, I think, with Harry. Maybe your fellowship days. I'm not sure. Yeah, look, but look at look at Sebastian. He looks like he's 12. Sebastian looks, uh, I, I know, like a, a pediatric person <laughs> walking to a meeting. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, Walter, as you can tell, is blessed with a spectacular sonorous voice. And he is uh, essentially a semi-professional or professional singer. I don't know, here he is in a choral. And of course, has written the beautiful Skull Base Surgery Strategies book recently that I highly encourage everybody uh, to get. Uh, 
So this is in Lebanon. I am, I use endonasal endoscopy a lot. Every Thursday, it's, it's my OR for endonasal endoscopy. So I'm prefacing this by saying this. This is a famous rock in Beirut, Lebanon. The reminds me of the concept of uh, looking through, peering through the keyhole. Uh, and this is another concept, Scott's parabola, how innovations come and go, essentially. They come, they peak, they go, and so forth. We'll come back to that. I am absolutely not against adopting a new surgical strategy or technique over an older one if it makes sense and if it is proven superior. So here are the logical changes where transcranial approach should be replaced by endonasal endoscopy. I'll give you some examples. I've switched pretty much all craniopharyngiomas. I almost all of them I do endonasally. It makes sense. That's where you're below the chiasm. You take this thing out, post-op looks great. Visual outcomes usually very good. Uh, something like this, like uh, without belaboring the, the point, this is an unusual case, a recent unusual case, somomatous juvenile active ossifying fibroma. Is there any question that this should be taken endonasally? There's no question. Who would do a transcranial approach for this? Not at all, even though it's heavily calcified. We did that, uh, endonasal, and the view, I mean, the view at the end is this. It's it. fantastic. Makes sense. This is logical. And that's a post-op, gross total resection, You're very right. aggressive resection. Uh, orbital apex schwannomas that are medial to the optic nerve. The old days, my residency and even first years of my practice, I would do a cranio-orbital approach to remove something like this. Makes no sense whatsoever. How do you remove this? Endonasal is the answer. Here is us, endonasal, lamina papyracea, uh, uh, opening the periorbita, drilling the OCR here. And uh, again, I'm, uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but the view is unequal. This is us, uh, this is me moving the medial rectus to the bottom and going through the orbital fat. Here is a lesion, comes out so easily, schwannoma. Uh, the patient will go home that day. This is truly outpatient surgery, these cases, uh, where you're not worried about CSF leak and so forth. Hello. All of that makes sense. It's another case I'm not going to show you. Cav uh, uh, somebody needs to mute it. Yeah. We're okay? All right. Uh, orbital apex cavernoma, same thing. I'm going to skip that video. This is one of only three cases of, tuber uh, of uh, anterior skull base meningiomas I've ever removed endonasally. It is a residual recurrent, I'm sorry, it's a re it original residual at another surgeon, recurred tuberculum cell meningioma post craniotomy, and the optic chiasm is stuck above. That one, it was small, midline. I said, well, that makes sense. I should do this endonasally. And here it is. It went very well. No problem at all. So let's talk about anterior skull base meningioma. At least, at, uh, so we know the cribriform area. We know the planum area. And we know the tuberculum area. Uh, here is my experience w uh, the last 10 years only. I don't, I, I'm, I'm still polling my experience from before. But over 10 years, I've done 580 meningiomas. You can see tuberculum cella, planum sphenoidale, uh, olfactory groove meningiomas, uh, the rest of the skull base and some convexity and stuff. So uh, let me start with this. There is, we are all, most of, not most of us, many of us are falling victim to the lure of marketing and the abuse of the nomenclature. When we say non-touch technique, it's nonsense. We're not touching the skin. We're destroying the nasal mucosa. I know I do it every day. I know what we're destroying to get in there. Uh, when we say minimally invasive, it is totally wrong. We mean minimal access surgery, maximum invasiveness. When we say no craniotomy, we don't really mean that. We say not a craniotomy that people or that the patient can see. The craniotomy is concealed through the nose. Don't, 
don't fool yourself into saying you're not doing a craniotomy when you're doing an endonasal approach. You are absolutely doing craniotomy. This is from my friend uh, Jim Liu, who's an excellent surgeon from one of their papers. They removed this tumor. Look at the post-op CTA. That is a craniotomy. It happens to be through the nose. You stop calling a craniotomy because it's through the nose? No, it's a craniotomy. Be they did a beautiful job, tumors out. There's another case of theirs. This is a craniotomy, tuberculum cella from below. So let's stop using those words in, in really, and I, of course, I'm not talking to the people present here. I'm just talking to an audience in general. We are, cannot mislead the public into thinking we're not doing craniotomy because we're going through the nose. I am, I, we are short on time, but I am going to skip, if you don't mind, olfactory groove meningioma. I was going to review the literature. Let me take you straight to, to the summary of olfactory groove meningioma without showing you the data. Uh, it is very clear, transcranial approach is clearly superior to the endonasal for olfactory groove meningioma, and the data that I skipped would have shown you that. Tuberculum cell meningioma, what does the literature say? Uh, 2013, I'm going to take you chronologically, systematic review, that's a paper uh, you just uh, showed, yes, but uh, you, what you've got to realize is that the volume of tumors removed in that meta-analysis transcranially were, were many fold larger than the ones done endonasally. So it's already an unfair comparison, and yet we have 21% CSF leak rate. People who are accomplished endoscopists, my good friend Henry Schroeder, this is his opinion even back in 2014, the endonasal approach has no advantage compared to the transcranial approach for anterior skull-based meningiomas. And I completely agree with him as I'll keep piling up the evidence for you. Uh, TSM is uh, tuberculosis cell meningioma, by the way. Grading scale to assess surgical outcome of transcranial versus endonasal. Nice paper by the UCSF group. Uh, a nice intuitive way to score the meningioma, whether it goes into the canal, doesn't go into the canal, and so forth. They give it a score of maximum six, a minimum of zero. It's a nice way to, to help categorize things, to know where it is, because it does make a difference. This is a nice paper. You should look at the height of the tumor. Do you have uh, pneumocinus uh, dilettans? Uh, uh, or is it a so-called high-lying lesion like this? Or is it a low-lying lesion like this? Uh, and then you perhaps could make some sense into choosing endonasal if it is really low-lying. But unless it's low-lying, it, uh, it does not make sense, as I will show you. Why? Because when they looked at their outcomes, they saw that essentially it did not make difference if it is, was not uh, low-lying. If the tumor involves surrounding structures other than the tuberculum cella or in cases major vascular complex, the transcranial approach is still an effective approach. 2019 retrospective comparison, TCA versus endonasal. Look where the residuals occur after endonasal. They're all on the side. They are on the dura of the clinoid. These look, they're even on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Look at B here. Uh, these are areas so easy to clear transcranially. On the other hand, the residuals you leave after transcranial approach are tumors you wouldn't have been able to really remove endoscopically because they're usually stuck on the carotid artery. So that's a huge difference. And that's why it does not make sense to me, again, one of the many reasons to do anterior skull-based meningiomas endonasally. Again, going back to my good friend, Henry Schroeder, um, 2018, uh, showed the, the results with transcranial with endoscopic assistance, not, not tra endonasal endoscopic, but transcranial endoscopic uh, 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 makes perfect sense. I, I, qualify, I classify this as transcranial approach. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you do an eyebrow incision, you do a la a lateral supraorbital, you do a pterinal, just do the smallest bone flap that you think in your own hands you can get away with. And if you're missing a corner, of course, introduce the endoscope, 
look around. Oh, we all understand the benefit of that. That's not what we're discussing here. We're discussing whether going through the nose or through the transcranial from above, the celestial or the terrestrial approach. That's what we're discussing. Meta-analysis of transcranial. Oh, sorry. Look, this is from, again, my good friend in Toronto, Gentili and his group. Read their conclusion. Um, however, the transcranial route still remains the most common approach for most tuberculum cell meningioma and for the majority of neurosurgeons. And for good reason. It's not because people don't know how to do endonasal, because they realize the benefit. This is the European Skull Base Society on behalf of the, uh, the section of the EANS last year put out, I'm not going to read you all their conclusions, but take my word or go read the paper yourself. The, essentially, they're saying the standard of, well, they didn't use that term, but the standard approach is still transcranial, although they recognize that it is controversial. You can read their six conclusions. The last one is really the one that talks about transcranial being, uh, being that. Uh, the contralateral transcranial approach sometimes makes sense, such as in this paper. Uh, I use it when the ipsilateral side is completely gone and you're trying to save the contralateral side and you don't believe you need to drill the anterior clinoid. So I would do a contralateral approach. Sometimes I cut the blind optic nerve uh, on the ipsilateral side to get a better view if necessary. I refer you to that paper. Um, I, I am going to skip, let me skip uh, um, other literature in general on anterior skull base meningiomas. Uh, and I want to show you our data. We, uh, we, we, lump, we uh, talked to the uh, UPMC folks. We lumped our data together uh, uh, at Pittsburgh and Miami. Uh, it's not published yet. It's still in the works. I'll, I'll take you straight to the relevant. So, of course, they favored endonasal. We favored transcranial. We had uh, 59 transcranial and 30 endoscopic cases. L look at the tumor volume. Uh, transcranial, the first column, 15 cc on average. Endoscopic, 5.6 cc. We're, we're dealing with three times larger tumors, which of course is the versatility of the transcranial approach. Um, I'll skip some of this stuff. I'll, um, optic canal invasion data and so forth. Uh, gross total resection, much better transcranially. And we're, we're comparing to, you know, to a group, the, 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 the top tier endoscopic surgeons in the world, 50% uh, gross total resection in the hands of masters. Uh, but here is an important slide. Yes, there is a trend for better vision with the endonasal approach, a trend, but notice, remember the volume difference. Very importantly, transcranial did not worsen the vision compared to endonasal. You see the box I have in green there. So we did not really hurt patient by going transcranially. We achieved a better gross total resection. I have no doubt it will result in better recurrence free survival over many years uh, without end, of course, uh, the complications of CSF leak and uh, and uh, I'll skip that. And uh, interestingly, hematoma, 4% in the endonasal group. So the logical conclusion, uh, and I skipped a lot of the literature that I was going to show you, is that visual outcome may or may not get bet be better with endonasal compared to transcranial. All the other factors favor transcranial. To me, transcranial approach is clearly superior to endonasal for tuberculum cell meningioma. The exceptions could be uh, a recurrent trans, uh, tuberculum cell, like I showed you, the, one of the three cases I've done uh, after a previous craniotomy and purely medial to the carotids, or perhaps a meningioma that has extended down into the sinuses and you really need to clear up the sinuses and of course go endonasally. Here is, I'll show you a couple of examples. You look at a case like this, very similar to what you just showed. You, say, you see that the tumor is medial to the optic nerve. Perhaps people would jump and say, oh, perfect endonasal case. Well, that would be a giant mistake because 
when I did this lateral supraorbital, it's a small craniotomy. I mean, once you open the dura, you're there in about 20 seconds, as opposed to here. I'll, I mean, so here's what I want to show you and what we all recognize. There is often tumor spilling lateral to the optic nerve that the MRI cannot pick up. And you uh, cannot be, you do not achieve a very good Simpson grade resection endonasally. Uh, here, look, look at that. Tumor on the dura of the clinoid, lateral to the optic nerve, totally resectable transcranially, unresectable endonasally. So unless we adjust our goals of treatment and we say, well, endonasally, we're going to achieve a Simpson grade four almost every time, not quite, uh, then we cannot be, we'll be talking apples and oranges. So I'm going to show you still pictures of the same case that would have appeared to be perfect for an endonasal approach. There is no way you're going to achieve as good as a trans uh, resection as uh, I am transcranially. Look at those images. Uh, look at the, um, it's packing the optic canal. And here I am removing it completely from the optic canal, dealing with the superior hypophyseal perforators with bimanual microscopic view, wide view. And here it is at the end. It is very close to a Simpson grade one because you cannot really remove the, opt the dura of the floor of the optic canal. You want to call it one and a half or a two. Uh, and here is as, uh, at the end, uh, post-op uh, uh, vision improved. Uh, here's another case. You might say, oh, this might be good for endonasal. Maybe, maybe you won't because of the ACA involvement, but it is not very lateral. It's pretty midline. And I want to show you that it would have been a nightmare had I done this endonasally. Again, a series of uh, still images to get you to, to, well, not to get you, to show the audience an appreciation of how difficult, even transcranially, it is to peel the perforators, the superior apophyseal perforators, look at the stalk, uh, look at Hubner. And this is me with, I mean, I'm an experienced surgeon doing bimanual dissection, sharp dissection. This was very difficult. I had a tough time getting this thing out of there. Look at the perforators engulfed. Can you imagine doing this endonasally? Uh, terrible, Ter would have been a terrible choice. And this is a contralateral optic canal. I, I'm the tumor going lateral to the contralateral optic nerve. And at the end, uh, gross total resection. I'll skip this video. Uh, people can get, patients can be harmed by the end inappropriate use of the endonasal approach. I'll show you from last year, patient with this tumor done endonasally elsewhere, uh, even though it spills over laterally, incomplete resection and blinded the patient on the left side. So it's a double whammy because, and, and, and fairly experienced endoscopic surgeon did that. So came to me, she's blind in the left eye. I did a craniotomy. She remained blind, of course, but at least I removed the tumor. So onto the conclusion, the celestial versus the terrestrial, as, uh, as Walter said, by the way, it's a book. You can look it up, Elias Teclado. So the, look at the difference. The view from above is so much better. Look at uh, Central Park in New York. <laughs> Look at the views from above. It's panoramic. You appreciate everything. And this is the ultimate celestial view from above. View from below. I encourage you, look at this, the review of some computer game called View from Below. <laughs> I have to read this. Uh, this is actually from the website. You play as a struggling high school student who is captured by a mysterious presence and taken to a scary <laughs> new world. You will fight <laughs> demons, solve puzzles, and unravel several dark <laughs> mysteries on your quest to escape it. Created almost entirely by one moron, me. This is the author of the... So that's what you face sometimes in poorly applied endoscopic approaches. You, from below, you lose the accurate perspective. And I'm talking, and, and I'm a 
quite an experienced endonasal endoscopist. I've done it for 15 years. It's a rather uninviting view for tuberculum cell I mean, in geoma. The ugliness of what you see, I have no comment. It's near. The beauty is far and out of your reach when you go endonasally. We're saying, we're comparing the wormly terrestrial at the top compared to the heavenly celestial at the bottom. Look at the difference in view of the, of the uh, in Paris, of the Eiffel Tower. So open approach to anterior skull base meningiomas is better because of access, manipulation, multiple degree of freedom, full control, resectability is so much better, better Simpson grading, more versatile reconstruction, less CSF leak rates. And I have a little, for joke, I have a little scale. I call it the Morco scale of judicious use of endonasal. I call it RSTUV to remember alphabetically. I think endoscopic approaches have been revolutionary for these lesions. You can read there. It's a superior approach for these lesions. It's a tentative approach for most midline schwannomas. And uh, the meningiomas of the anterior skull base fall into my U, the uninspired. I think doing uh, anterior skull base meningiomas endonasally is a completely uninspired, with all due respect to those who are doing them. And of course, it's very, very irresponsible to do complex vascular work endonasally. So I think cellar lesions are standard of care endonasally. I think most people are realizing anterior skull base meningiomas should come down Scott's parabola. You should do it transcranially. You don't have to do a giant transcranial approach to do it. You can do it through a very small keyhole, supraorbital, endoscope assisted. But going through the nose on these is wrong. Uh, you can read an old editorial I've written about eight years ago about my general thoughts about this. And a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I stop talking right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jacques. Um, for, for the audience, um, I set up this debate today uh, like this because I know the very strong views that Professor Morcos has uh, on this topic. Uh, that is why I polled uh, Professor Yao and Professor Watanabe, uh, amongst others, uh, to, to have almost like a team to, to sort of um, take the other side so, because I know he's so strong on this side. Um, uh, back to the telestial and celestial, I have to say that, I, you know, as a Princetonian, I'm a tiger. So by definition, I'm the terrestrial. My mother happened to be a dragon uh, in the zodiac, Chinese zodiac, so she was terrestrial. So I, I've been doing this for my, my whole life. Um, um, I, 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 still, I still think that there are selected uh, cases that are maybe perhaps suitable for endoscopy. And, and it's interesting that you said the volume is so uh, skewed in those uh, studies. Uh, the transcranial is so big and uh, this, the endoscopic is so small. Well, maybe because the endoscopic is really suited for small tumors. And when there are particular yeah, small yeah. tumors, it may I, be. No, no, I don't disagree. And obviously that shows that people who are doing the work are smart and are ch cherry picking, which is what they, sh which is what they should do. But uh, the problem is, as Sam al Mefti, sorry to interrupt you, Walter, has shown many years ago, the, what I, 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 in my rush, I didn't mention the tail of meningioma entering the optic nerve, very hard to find always on MRI. At least 50% of the cases at surgery, you see a tail going there. And unless you drill, the, and I do drill the clinoid routinely on every tuberculum cell meningioma. And uh, I'd say 40% of the time, I see a tail that goes in there that totally missed on MRI, which is, which is why I also feel so strongly about this. I hope that the young audience can take away from this uh, uh, session tonight a couple of things. One is that I think you should have both, both sets of skills if you can develop them. But inevitably, you will be more comfortable with one set of skills over another set of skills. And you have to be very judicious with your choice, how comfortable you are with your own skills, with your own experience, with your own complications in choosing something for a specific patient for a specific tumor. Uh, there's no one size fits all and there's no one size that fits all surgeons because everybody's experience profile, complication profiles, and learning profiles are completely different. So be very, very careful what you choose uh, for approach and, and understand that it's a very personal thing. Um, what else? 
uh, that there is uh, perhaps, uh, uh, I, I hope I'm not taking words out of your mouth and, and, and contradicting what you said, Jock, but, but there isn't really no right answer for some tumors. There are right answers for some tumors, but there are some tumors are in between and uh, we, we can disagree and reasonable people can disagree uh, with some certain tumors. And I think, uh, again, not to, not, you know, I, I think for Calvin's tumor, um, personally, I, I would have still chosen the, the, the endonasal approach. Uh, forgive me, Sean, for, for doing that. It's okay. Uh, no, we, we can disagree. It's all right. It's no... For everybody who, who's here, uh, thank you. Um, wonderful job, Isish, for, for being on the hot seat. Hopefully that was not too hot. Uh, Calvin, thank you for your very uh, thorough uh, analysis of, of the literature and, and your, your demonstration of your mastery on your video. And Jacques, uh, always, uh, you are, that is why you're the master. You're very convincing uh, on, on your argument on this. And uh, I will look forward to your next section with us. For those uh, uh, anticipating our next session, uh, we, we have a very handsome presenter uh, scheduled for next time. Uh, that would be me. Uh, so I am on the presenter seat uh, next time with uh, Professor Teet Matheson as the discussant uh, on something that I'm not going to, you know, give away here. Uh, Professor Wong will be uh, moderating. So uh, with, with great thanks for the audience and even bigger thanks for the panelists, I bid you good evening and I will see you uh, next time. Good night. Thank you, Walter. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.